Um, my name is Eleanor Savage. Um, I'll be hosting this conversation with the brilliant Rachel Kushner. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting tonight on the stolen lands of the Boon Wurrung and Woi Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge, on behalf of the Wheeler Centre and myself, those landowners, past, present and emerging, whose sovereignty was never and will never be ceded. It is always necessary to acknowledge the traditional owners of the beautiful land that we are very lucky to meet on. But it's especially pertinent at, a, at an event in which we will be discussing the law, the state, prisons and freedom. There is nothing natural about these ideas. They are always historically conditioned. Growing up, I lived for a long time near a historic prison called Pentridge, which was decommissioned in 1997 and more recently was turned into a middle-class, medium-density housing estate. Prisons are unpleasant to look at. When my tram would pass Pentridge every day on my way to school, I had trouble not thinking up the bodies that were buried there. It was a prison that had some prestige. It's where Ned Kelly and Ronald Ryan were executed, and it's where a lot of Melbourne's glorified and romanticised organised criminals lived out their sentences. But pedigree aside, the prison's origin can tell us something about the shape and texture of Australia today. Chain gangs made up of its first prisoners started building Sydney Road in the 1850s. This is an incredibly important trade route. And this can tell us something about the material connection between early capital and nation building projects and incarceration. Secondly, the first two prisoners to be legally executed at Pentridge were the Aboriginal resistance fighters, Tanaminawait and Moor Boyhina. This tells us something about what and who the state needs to erase in order to legitimate itself and how prisons remain an important site of erasure. Today, Aboriginal people make up 3% of the nation's population, yet they account for 28% of the prison population. This makes First Nations people the most incarcerated ethnicity in the world. More than 400 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have died in custody since the end of the Royal Commission in 1991. When we talk about prisons, we are talking about the value of life and freedom and how the conditions of freedom are profoundly unequally distributed. These conditions neither start nor end with prison. And so when we talk about prisons, we're talking about who is valued in a society, which stories are worth telling and which voices are heard. But you did not come here to listen to me preach. You came here to, to hear from Rachel Kushner, who is a novelist in possession of the rare talent of being able to hold all of that information I'm trying to communicate, the information of searing injustice, without turning it into a defensive pose or a puritanical constraint. Kushner does not force her characters into position. They move about. They are good and they are bad. In other words, they are vital, living, nuanced beings. Both of Kushner's first two critically acclaimed novels, Telex from Cuba and The Flamethrowers, were finalists for the National Book Award. Last year, The Mars Room was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction, and it won the Medici Prize. I am certain that it will accrue many more honours over time. The Mars Room is a prison novel unlike any other. It is a social novel, novel that neither tub thumps nor chest beats. Its characters are ordinary people living extraordinary lives. They are funny and wily and cynical and charming. As our heroine Romy reminds us, people in prison are clever as hell. Uh, welcome Rachel Kushner to the Athenaeum tonight. <laughs> Um, and Rachel's going to read us an excerpt from the Mars Room. So. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you have a complicated history here uh, in Australia, which you've outlined a little bit of. 
And um, I feel sorry for you guys because we don't have a complicated history at all in the United States. So um, good luck with that. Uh, all right. He would not call it loaded, how he felt when he got on the plane. He was only starting to relax. He'd been on edge the whole time in Cancun. It was supposed to be a vacation, but minute by minute, he kept checking in with himself to find out if he was having fun, and he didn't know, and this made him anxious, so he took another clonopin and lay down, or got up, or went to the bar, or walked around on the sand, but it burned his feet, and he had to face down the fact that he was not a beachy type person, and just wanted to get home and go to the Mars room and see Vanessa put her body in his lap. It was the only way in the world he knew to get peace. Every person deserves peace. He meant whether anyone deserves anything is beside the point. He needed certain things to feel okay. Vanessa was among those things. He needed dark and heavy curtains because he had a sleeping problem. He needed clonopin because he had a nerve problem. He needed Oxycontin because he had a pain problem. He needed liquor because he had a drinking problem. Money because he had a living problem and show him someone who doesn't need money. He needed this girl because he had a girl problem. Problem was maybe the wrong word. He had a focus. Her name was Vanessa. That was her stage name, but for him it was her name name because it was the one he got to know her by. Vanessa filled in around all the hazier thoughts in his mind with something that was specific and real. When he was near her, he felt good. Every person deserves to feel good, especially him, since he was himself. There was a couple next to him turned inward toward each other like they didn't really want to talk, but he tried anyway. Sometimes shooting the breeze with people on the airplane kills time. He told them about his boat, and he didn't actually have a boat, but he'd been talking for so long like he did have a boat that he basically, at this point, owned a boat. <laughs> but they weren't interested. So he turned to the kid across the aisle, started telling him about his boat. Sometimes he thought of people as kid, called grown men kid, but this kid? was a kid kid, Kurt realized. How old are you, he asked. 13. Nice. Kurt said it with a way to go, all right kind of tone. Kids, they like to be encouraged. He was rewarding this kid for being 13. 13 was puberty, old enough to get off. A woman came up the aisle and leaned over the kid. Kid got up from his seat. A man came up the aisle and sat where the kid had been. They were a family, and they were switching. Nice knowing you, Kurt said, and the kid said, you too. No one would talk to him, or rather listen, so he got his book out, Chicken Hawk, a Vietnam thing he'd been trying to read for three years. It interested him because he had begun long ago telling people he was in combat, but he never was. He was stationed in Germany. The book was about a helicopter pilot, and Kurt wasn't even halfway through. He read a few pages, but reading was difficult for him. The problem with reading was how relentless it was. You manage to concentrate long enough to read a whole paragraph, and then there's another one, and they just kept coming. <laughs> he did it mainly as an act for the other people on the plane, except no one was watching him or noticing. He put Chicken Hawk away. He could not get his screen to work, so he closed his eyes and planned for when he'd be home and could go see Vanessa. The first time Kurt ever saw her, he'd been keeping company with a hothead named Angelique. He and Angelique were dancing in the tunnel thing at the back of the Mars room. They called it dancing, but the whole time you're just trying to rub up on them. There was another couple in the tunnel thing, a businessman and Vanessa. She was glued to this man in a suit in her bra and underwear. 
Angelique said loudly that Vanessa was breaking a rule. And was she high? What drug was she on? Because you can't fuck in the tunnel. It was fine to massage men's laps with your buttocks, but if you did that frontally, other girls would get on your case. Yeah, I'm high, Vanessa said, swaying into the businessman. It's a drug called happiness. You should try it sometime. She continued to grind against the businessman, the man himself taking no notice of the argument between the two women, and instead moving against pretty Vanessa like a man might dance with his wife on their golden anniversary, or in a TV commercial spotlighting an occasion like that to sell Viagra. Kurt thought it was funny. Later, Vanessa passed him on the aisle, and he told her so. She said, I don't like to talk, but if you want a lamp dance, I'm 20 a song. So he gave her an Andrew Jackson, as the girls called them, and that's how it started. The usual way it started with any girl at the Mars room, except this chick was not just using him for the money. Something was happening between them. They all did a stage show, or were supposed to, and when it was Vanessa's turn, he sat closer to the stage than usual. When Angelique saw him alone and tried to offer company, he told her to get lost. Vanessa wore mirrored sunglasses that gave a comic edge to her performance. She put her legs up, and they were the most gorgeous legs he'd ever seen. Some of the girls there had pale and flabby legs, shapeless tubes that reminded Kurt of glass syringes. Vanessa's legs were leg legs, long and tapered. It was a joke, comedy, that this world-class chick was on stage at the Mars Room. He was in on it, you better believe it. She was high on life, the way everyone ought to try sometime, but hadn't or couldn't because they were not free the way she was. Cute ass, her tits were cute too, grabbable, handful-sized, and then she showed the whole thing bending upside down. That was his favorite the way it all looked from behind when they bend over. She was doing it just for him. She knew, this chick really knew. That was the thing about Vanessa. She wasn't an idiot barking up the wrong tree. It was all the right tree. She understood how to turn him on and she was doing it. She sat with him when her stage show was over. Know what I like about you? It was a setup for him to answer his own question. Everything. He liked to be the one to do the talking. He felt good with her. He felt comfortable. He loved to touch her. His hands were everywhere. He gave her 20 after 20, went out and got more money and gave her that too, got more and gave her that because he really, really, really liked this girl. He started going more frequently to the Mars room. He was supposed to be at home recovering from his accident, but he got bored at home He'd crashed outside the projects on Potrero Hill and mangled his leg, slid all the way across the intersection, had four operations, and walked now with a limp. They called it an accident, but to Kurt, it was attempted murder. Kids in the projects had dumped motor oil in the middle of the street so he would wipe out. He had tried to serve legal documents, simply doing his job to an address in the projects repeatedly without luck. On his sixth visit, he knew as soon as he hit the intersection and went into a slide what they'd done to him, but there was no way to find the actual kids and prove it. He was stuck at home, waiting for his knee to heal. He was told it might not. His apartment became a waiting room with no end to the waiting. He would shuffle around, sit on his couch, flip through a magazine, change the TV channel, stare into the fridge, watch cars move down the street, do his 10 exercises, watch cars try to parallel park. Hardly anyone knew how to parallel park. He'd sit on the bed, read the same sentence over in his book, Chicken Hawk, realize he was doing that, change TV channels, and finally get up, ride over to the Mars room, and limp in to see if Vanessa was working. He knew a lot of girls there now, but the only one he liked was Vanessa. He told her he was a homicide investigator, it wasn't a total lie. He wanted to investigate the kids who tried to kill him by putting a lake of motor oil in the intersection near the projects. 
he had learned not to tell people he was a process server because when he explained how you serve papers, the tactics you are forced to use, it didn't sound noble. People treated him like he was some kind of scumbag repo man. He talked to Vanessa about all the tensions in his life without giving details. He talked and talked. He touched her bare skin with his hands and said things, expressed feelings, and got attached. He got attached to her. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I watched the video this afternoon of the, the politician. He went to the strip club in Washington, DC, the Australian guy. Are you guys following this story? As I said before we came out on stage, nothing is um, beneath me. So, <laughs> so I wrote that on my way here tonight. <laughs> Um, thanks, Rachel. For me, the qualities that make The Mars Room such an extraordinary novel um, are, firstly, its sense of humour. It's seductive and totally hilarious. Um, and secondly, I was really impressed by the way that it naturalises some of the more disturbing and incredible facts of prison life. But also, you just read that Kurt Kennedy section, and, I mean, the details of his kind of life are quite vivid as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you came to learn so very much about the details of life in prison without ever having been incarcerated yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for those who haven't read my book, much of it doesn't really read like what I just read, although it's not an unimportant component of the book to give um, Kurt's version of his own story. He becomes fixated on the main character, Romy. And much of the book is her in the first person. And I, I, I've read this section that I just read um, you know, a few times. And um, I, I, I read that section in a bookstore in Portland, Oregon. And a woman said, she raised her hand in the Q&A section. And she said, what you read is not at all representative of your novel. It has nothing to do with the book. And I said, no, it's, it's in the book. <laughs> I, and she still wasn't satisfied. Uh, so it's funny to think of like what, you know, what part of the book is sort of um, demonstrates the different things that the book can do. But, you know, much of the book is told from the perspective of a young woman who um, ends up going to prison with a sentence of two consecutive life terms. Um, and how did I end up knowing so much about prisons? Well, I mean, you know, a lot of the book obviously doesn't take place uh, in prison and is more about the larger structure of contemporary life, which interests me just um, as a person and as a Californian. And um, I grew up in San Francisco in the same neighborhood where I have my narrator, uh, wh where she's from, where she grew up. <laughs> and um, for whatever reason, the kids from the city um, it, that I knew growing up um, aren't like at the Wheeler Center doing literary events. <laughs> um, and I did know some people who ended up um, very quite early on having relationships to the state rather than relationships just with their family. Like I think among middle class people and upper middle class people, there are things that happen inside of families that get worked out in the family. And then there are people where you know, because of poverty and instability, um, they're already sort of in relationship to the state with their defiance rather than just with their parents. And I, I saw quite a lot of that growing up. And um, there were some people who ended up going to prison. And I don't, tr I don't, I'm hesitant to attribute my motivations or interests in this material to this sort of autobiographical strain of it. I'm always a little suspicious of that even in myself, but nonetheless, I think these things can mark a person. Just having one friend go to prison and see what prison does to people, and not just the institution, but the sort of social um, mechanisms that develop among people inside prison and the way people become good at prison, which is the other side of becoming very not good at mm. living in the outside world mm. and then becoming incapable of living in the outside world, basically. Um, so I had some exposure to that. And then as a Californian, 
Um, I got to a point in my own life where I wanted to learn everything I could about the criminal justice system. And I just think it's, it was the moment I was passing through. And um, I live in Los Angeles. I live walking distance from the huge criminal court complex downtown, which is um, a five minute drive from the huge jail complex in Los Angeles, which is the largest jail complex in the world. And I just started you know, being curious about the um, sheriff's buses that shuttle back and forth between the jail and the court all day long. And I was curious about some very basic things that a lot of people, you know, lawyers know about this because they live this life, criminal lawyers particularly, but, um, you know, the, the, the court portion of a person's relationship or their engagement with the state through the juridical system, that portion's public, and anyone can go into a courtroom and watch proceedings. And then once they are convicted and sentenced and remanded, as they call it, that word really gives me chills, once they're remanded to state prison, then they're sent way up into the Central Valley of California where we grow almost half the nation's food. And a lot of the people in prison up there, in fact, 65% are from metropolitan Southern California. So they're urban people from Los Angeles. They're from like former deindustrialized urban cores and they are sent up to this sparsely populated, very rural, very conservative, um, irrigated industrial farmland. And so I guess I just became very interested in that. And I started um, volunteering with a human rights organization that does work in um, the big women's prison in California that is kind of what I modeled my prison on. Mine's called Stanville. It's called uh, Central California Women's Facility or Chowchilla. Um, but that, that work and the people that I got to know there didn't really, inf it did inform the book in certain ways because there are like mechanics um, to life in prison and survival strategies and tricks that I would not have known about mm -hmm. unless people told me about them. But the, the stories of the people that I know in prison are so particular to them that none of that went into... Um, my book. The book is built more of people that had been germinating in me for much longer, you know, many years longer. But yeah, but different methods, I guess. Yeah. And I and then I went to on this like crazy tour to almost every men's prison in California, which you know California is a huge state. Yeah. Um, you know, we're like the fifth largest economy in the world, as if we were our own country and we spend more money on prisons than any other state. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of prisons and they're all new. Like they've been built since 1992. Um, so I, and I saw a lot going on that trip because I was with people who wanted to get jobs working um, as prison guards, basically. And I, I didn't really understand that that was the purpose of the trip until afterward. <laughs> I was just told by the criminology professor who ran it that A, he was retiring, meaning like if he got caught having a writer on his bus. He couldn't get fired. He, right. And B, just say I was a continuing education student. <laughs> and I was with these kids who, you know, were 21 years old and for whom I was probably just a, a curiosity, like this weird hippie lady on the bus um, who didn't say much. <laughs> but, um, but it was quite interesting to be with them because the public information officer at each prison that greeted us really spoke in a very relaxed way around these people because they all felt uh, the wardens, the public officer, and the guards, you know, who took us into places like, they have this thing called the investigative services unit. I mean, I guess it's like the Navy SEALs of each prison. I mean, prison guards are low on the totem pole of um, service people. And they consider themselves police officers. Police don't consider prison guards police officers. Uh, but the investigative service unit is kind of like the elite commando inside the prison. And they usher you into these places because they're, they're among people who are aspire to have careers like that. And it's like those ads for the army, mm -hmm. be all you can be. And they're like, you got to be ready for this. This is gladiator school. <laughs> and then they show their own collection of closed circuit videos of um, people stabbing other people to death. And it's really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. um, but I was kind of interested in that whole culture and, the, and also interested in, I'm sorry, I'm going on a really long time. Okay. But I just want to finish. I was also interested in 
Like what happens to me if I just expose myself to this reality, which is mm. concurrent with my own reality and running all the time, it's there. I have a pre-prepared question, but what does happen to you when you put yourself through that and when you expose yourself to that reality, which is usually concealed from you? Right. Gosh, I mean, it's hard to have a concise answer to that, and I feel like I gave a way too long answer to the last question. <laughs> um, I think at first I was worried. I was interested in this was my own sort of pathetic version of bravery, which is like not hiding behind my hair, and, um, <laughs> and just watching the video, and also thinking, this is the third prison where they added Guns N' Roses' Welcome to the Jungle to their closed circuit um, snuff film. I'm not, it's yeah, bizarre, but true, factoid. Um, but I, I think in the short run, it's really traumatic and mm. tough. And it's tough to think about the sort of, if you will, the frag radius, to use a military parlance, um, not just for the people in prison who are involved in that, but the people who work in those prisons. Mm. Um, the people who work in prisons in California are... Um, working class people who generally only have either a high school education or have taken an equivalency exam. And they have a rate of mental illness and suicide that's almost as high as people coming back from active mm -hmm. military duty. So I thought about them too, and that was all short-term trauma. And then in the long run, um, I think I realized that there are certain aspects of who you are, and um, maybe it's a kind of vulgar term, but certain components of your innocence that um, remain mm. and endure in you regardless of what you force yourself to think about and acknowledge. Mm. So, yeah. So, I mean, part of that is kind of, yeah, the, the erasure and you're exposing yourself to, to things that are supposed to be concealed from you as a middle class person. Um, erasure and disappearance are kind of themes that recur again and again in the Mars Room. Um, Romy says, a lot of history is not known. A lot of worlds have existed that you can't look up online or in any book. And she's actually talking about the scummers when she says that, which is a group of like Satanists who sell drugs to make a living in San Francisco. So there are these kind of twin disappearances happening that I think might relate to each other. And one of them is the disappearance of like feral San Francisco, the San Francisco of weirdos and delinquents. And then a parallel disappearance of those kinds of people, like the people who should be in society, but are kind of whisked away and disappeared and taken to isolated prisons. Yeah. Um, when you were writing The Mars Room, did you see these two disappearances as being linked? That's, I love your question. It's so eloquent and perceptive. I didn't quite see them being linked, but that doesn't mean that they aren't linked, you know? I mean, it's one of the pleasures of writing a book is that then you have sensitive readers reading it who can look into the structure and see things that were probably there, um, but more unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the scummers, this, this was this group in San Francisco. They're real? Well, so... There was a group called the Scummers, and the, it's a Z on the end, not an S. <laughs> and I was taken there as a child um, by another girl who uh, lived with us. She, my parents became her guardians because her family kicked her out. And um, I don't know where she is right now, but uh, it was a lifelong friend. And um, we went there to buy purple microdot. Does anybody remember that? This LSD. And, uh, you know, we were like 11 years old, and I went into this house. It was right on the corner of Haight and Ashbury. And you go in, and just like I describe in the book, every single room had been painted with tennis balls soaked in paint. <sighs> so there was this ricochet effect, really like somebody had just scribbled on your brain. <laughs> and um, there was a boy there cooking something at the stove, and then this woman sitting at a table and you wait and she kind of ignores you and then she sells you your drugs and you buy them and you leave. And um, I have never found anyone else who went there or knew about those people. But I know exactly where that house is still in the Haight-Ashbury. And the person who took me there, who was a beloved friend, um, 
was more free to destroy herself than I was in life, which is how I put it because that's how I saw things when I was young, were the people who were free to really take bold risks um, in the short run that in the long run, you know, hurt them terribly. Uh, so she would maybe be the person to remember the scummers, but I don't think she would remember the scummers because she's living in the present tense mm -hmm. in a way that I'm not. These things happened when I was young and I've thought about them ever since. And then suddenly the occasion um, makes itself known to incorporate this into a book and you think, it's not so much about the scummers qua scummers. It's that they activated something in me or were, are now, or would have been a portal to a disappeared memory of a time and a place mm -hmm. and a people. And not so much sociologically, you know, like an Oliver Stone movie about the doors or something like this was to the hate Ashbury. <laughs> Although that could be there and it would be a legitimate way to get glean something from the book, but it's somehow deeper for me. And at the end of that chapter, the character says, you know, um, where is everyone and mm -hmm. what has happened to them? And I, I'm stunned by that question continually, like every moment of my life. Mm. And some of that is, I think, the people who disappeared into life, mm -hmm. but which didn't treat them very kindly. Mm -hmm. And there is certainly also the disappearance of people into prison. Um, Michel Foucault wrote this, he wrote an introduction to a book he never wrote. And the book was meant to be called Lives of Infamous Men. And his idea for this book was that it would be based on records he found in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris of convicts from the early 18th century. And the, it, it's like a data book that just, it's a log that has name, age, um, the town where they were prosecuted and what they had been uh, convicted of. And his idea was to write this book of real, real people. And in the introduction to it, he, again, he didn't write the book, but in the introduction he says um, something to the effect of lives that should have remained obscure were illuminated. What illuminated these lives was the light of power. And you think about someone going into a courtroom to have their life altered um, permanently and then going to prison and it, it, it's a very obscure person and suddenly they're there. So yeah, it's an interesting comparison of those two disappearances. That's a good segue to my next question, which is um, that there's a lot of reading in the Mars room. Um, in one Not of too much reading though. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's hard to read one paragraph comes after the In one the of my other. favorites, <laughs> In one of my favorite sections of the book, Sammy Fernandez, a character who has spent most of her life in prison, is quite kind of structured by prison, um, describes write, reading eight Danielle Steele novels in a year. Uh, well, and she, she talks about one she read in administrative segregation. She says, she did a prison novel that is straight up killer. Everybody was reading it. We tore the book into sections for passing under the cell doors and it was all people talked about. It blew through prison like a forest fire. It never occurred to me that it was odd a woman in prison would want to read about other women in prison. You want to read about the world you know, not just the ones you don't know. And you've said in interviews, Rachel, that when you're writing, you're not thinking about an audience. But I was wondering if it ever occurred to you while you were writing The Mars Room that it might be a book that women in prison might burn through like forest fire. Well, I mean, that would be a pretty high aspiration, you know, <laughs> um, to want to entertain in that way. Um, I've never read a Danielle Steele novel, but that what what you re I mean, a, a lot of the book is more imagined, but that that is based on something that um, my friend uh, Teresa Martinez told me, and the book is called Malice, and she said it was by far the most popular novel at. Chowchilla um, is the largest women's prison in the world. There are, now there are about, I think, 3,800 women there. There used to be 4,500 women there. Um, and this book was really popular in prison, and it, I was told about it at a time when I was kind of new to getting to know Chowchilla and the women there. And I naively thought, 
God, I mean, it seems like, you know, you'd, you'd want to get a break from this place and read a novel that's not <laughs> like um, a blood passion, like fight to the death in a women's prison love story. Um, but again, it was a naive question because I, you know, I posted it to my friend Teresa and she basically said, you know, we get to read about our lives too. You guys like to read books about your lives. And uh, I thought about that a lot since the book came out because I've, ha I've, I did an event, there was one event I did in Los Angeles where um, somebody raised their hand and asked a question about what it was I was trying to communicate to them, like what my message was about prisons. And it was an innocent question, but the them in her question suggested a very particular readership, which in the United States is a kind of like national public radio, what's the equivalent of NPR, ABC, a sort of, you know, educated <laughs> coastal <Center>. elite. <laughs> um, like, tell us how you meant to make us feel. And luckily for me, uh, this woman in the audience raised her hand and said, I would like to answer that question. And um, she said, I, uh, am, I live in the Central Valley, and my daughter is a guard at Chowchilla, and my son's incarcerated. And my daughter read this book and begged me to come down here and get you to sign it. And she'd driven five hours from the prison and talked about her experience of reading the book and her family reading the book and feeling like a reality that they live and know mm -hmm. also gets to be in literature. And it was a rewarding moment. And you have, I mean, you have friends or kind of ongoing relationships with women who are incarcerated. Have you shown the book? To oh yeah, that reminds mates? me. I hadn't fully answered your question, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I as I was writing the book, I was planning that you know my first readers would be yeah. my friends who are uh, in prison, and yeah. they were, and they're all thanked in the back of the book also. Yeah. And I have a my friend Teresa is formerly incarcerated. She was in that prison and another CIW for 23 years. Um, and she, you know, she was the first person who read the book. And she read it in pieces as I was yeah. writing it. So yeah, very much so. And um, I was doing readings at prisons in California, which uh, were the most exciting readings I've ever done. But <laughs> unfortunately, I'm like now banned from the California Department of Corrections, so I won't be doing any more readings. But I can still mail the book to people, but individually. How, how did you get banned? It's petty of them. I mean, they... I, <laughs> Um, well, I brought a New Yorker journalist to a legal visit with a human rights organization, mm -hmm. and those visits are supposed to just be lawyers and staff, and I'm nominally staff because I was on the, I was on an advisory board for the organization, but the woman I brought in, Dana Goodyear, mm -hmm. who was writing a profile of me, um, had nothing to do with Justice Now. And I agreed to bring her into the prison. I mean, she wanted it to have some excitement. And when you write about, you profile a novelist, there's not a whole lot of material, you know? <laughs> it's like some frumpy person who's like, and this is where I work, mm. you know? It's just their couch, their, ta their tacky throw or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so they always want to put some action in. And I agreed to bring her in the prison because she agreed to mention three people I know who are currently serving life sentences who would like to get relief from the state and um, each are possibly going up for a retrial or before a parole board. And she also agreed to talk to the lawyers of those people and let them approve the wording. And it was like a chance, you know, speaking of this F Foucauldian idea about mm. s an obscure person being lit by power. It was mm. a chance for these people to have a little bit of control over how they're represented. But I knew that it was a risk bringing her in, but I also kind of arrogantly thought, oh, these people aren't going to read the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> but somebody <laughs> did. Uh, so that's what happened. Um, I want to talk about Romy. Um, we probably have like two questions left before we take it to the audience. Um, I want to know a bit more about Romy. She's a woman my age who's been sentenced to two life sentences plus six years for killing her stalker, whose narrative you just heard. Um, so the novel, the narrative voice in the novel moves that around quite a bit, but it's always returning to Romy. Um, 
And I don't know what it says about me, but I found her to be very familiar as a character. Um, I don't live her life clearly, but I felt while reading her that if I'd been given a slightly different set of circumstances, I might be. Um, how did she come to be the centre of this novel? How did she come to you and what does she mean to you? Well, um, it was hard for me to develop the voice for the book. Of course, once I did, it just flowed like a river. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. But um, it, it, that was a tricky part of it. There were other parts that I wrote really easily. Like Kurt's part just came to me and, um, you know, very easily. And there's a char male character named Doc that came to me very easily. And Romy was more difficult, and I think part of that was that I, I was resistant to making her somebody who would be very familiar to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's tricky to explain why, but I am not somebody who historically has used autobiographical material in my books. And I, I don't have judgments about other people doing it, but I'm just not that interested in my own life. Or I see the novel as a way to take leave of the self, even if it also always means like re-encountering yourself, mm -hmm. but in a dark alley, kind of encountering your unconscious. Um, but in this case, I basically couldn't write the book unless I made her a girl who was very, very familiar to me because I needed the depth of understanding of who she was in order to make her believably and plausibly someone in prison. Um, I am not somebody who would end up in prison and that's very clear to me. Um, that doesn't mean I'm a, a good person, it just means that there were interventions in my life you know, that I was nurtured that were quite starkly different from w what other lives around me lacked. And Romy, in a way, is not an amalgamation, but maybe a synthesized creature who bears the mark of my understanding of so many women that I knew growing up. Um, so she's imagined, but it took a long time to sort of hone her voice because it's a first person, kind of a testimonial voice. I'm really interested in the first person, but in, in many different ways I'm interested in the testimonial voice because it seems to be making a confession, but it's also totally in control of what information is being shared. And she is in a place when the book begins, when she's on a prison bus and going to serve her sentence, and that is not a space psychologically where you're open and sharing a lot of information about what's happened to you. Um, prison is not a space for reflection. A lot of people were like, well, you didn't really share how guilty she feels. And prison is not a place where people have room to think a lot about mm -hmm. guilt. I don't think, that's my interpretation, knowing people who are there, which isn't to say that I know most because I haven't, you know, I haven't spent time in prison, but it's a tough place and there's no privacy at all, and there's a lot of, um, it's just, it's stressful, and you have to be strong, and so I think that people deny a lot of mm -hmm. what they're feeling. So her testimonial voice is more toughened and clipped mm -hmm. and controlled, but I don't know, it just, you know, it just came to me, and once the voice was there, it was pretty easy to, to write her. Mm. Thank you. Um, this is my final question before we take it to the audience. Um, in that New Yorker profile by Dana Goodyear, uh, you told her that when you finished writing The Mars Room, I have no idea how this question is going to go, by the way. Your husband You're doing a great job, apparently so I'm sure it'll go said well. To you, apparently he said to you, maybe the bad Rachel is all out of your system. <laughs> that was in the profile. <laughs> Can you explain who is this bad Rachel? Is there the good Rachel? And what bearing do these personas or these roles kind of have on your work? I, he says he never said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I could sort of see him saying that. Mm -hmm. um, and what would he be referring to when he said such a, such a thing? What would he have been referring to? Yeah. I mean, a whole host of things. <laughs> but in this context, yeah, well... What comes to mind first is, and I'm, I'm sure this is perfectly obvious, but you know, people really are made of 
contradictory components, contradictory parts. And in a way, those contradictions are the truth of the person, the way things don't cohere. Like this journalist who's now come up twice, Dana, she did, you know, lovely person. I spent a bunch of time with her. But when you're being profiled for a magazine, um, it's an awkward, it's an awkward thing. It, it's, it's a great opportunity for your publisher. They're excited about it. But unless you have a kind of built-in um, mythology about you, it's not clear how to do it. Mm. Like, as my husband said to me, well, it's too late to get a bunch of hunting trophies up on the walls around here. <laughs> and you probably don't want to get all your teeth removed like Michelle Welbeck did. Um, did he really? Is that he seems story? to have done that, yeah. Oh. I know, no one's talking about that. But, <laughs> uh, but, you know, so, like, the things you do to, represent, to form um, a, a, an extreme impression of yourself for others is also a way of hiding mm. who you are. And instead of doing that, I tried to show her different parts of myself and my life and the people who know me. And then they interview all these people who've known mm. you over the course of your life. I tried to show her things that didn't cohere or make any sense whatsoever, and yet all absolutely were true and had to do with me. Um, and I don't want to over accentuate, overemphasize it, but as I mentioned, I you know grew up with people who started having struggles with the law quite early, and um, it was a tough environment, and that's what I come out of in mm. a lot of ways. But then I'm also this like fancy writer, you know? <laughs> so those two things don't really fit. So which one's the together. bad Rachel? <laughs> right. Not the fancy writer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll open it up to questions. So please queue up in the aisles and ask Rachel anything. Uh, a very simple question. Have you ever been hunting? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wow. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I haven't been hunting. I have. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. I, I sprayed carpet cleaner on a grasshopper once, and I still feel terrible about it. So you're an urban woman. <laughs> it died a really slow death, and then I just kept squirting the nozzle at it. <laughs> But no, also I'm a vegetarian. So. I don't have anything against hunting. My husband's family, we're all hunters. Hi, yeah, I just wondered if you had any interest in other prison literature and if so, how this book relates to those other uh, genres. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting genre and at first I was trying to define the genre. Um, and asking myself basic questions about it, like is prison literature literature exclusively written by people who've been in prison, or can it include you know the big Dostoevsky novel, um, or even a novel by somebody like John Cheever, who really I think wrote a great prison novel, Falconer. But um, so you know I collected a lot of books um, by and about prison. Um, that were styled and shaped as novels, and um, you know, there's many I'm interested in. Um, Angels by Dennis Johnson, his first novel, in a certain way could be called that, and it, you know, it ends um, with a uh, with a death sentence, with um, with a with a killing in a, of a, the character in a gas chamber. Um, it, it's an amazing book, I think. I don't, is Dennis Johnson popular in Australia the way he is in the United States? I mean, he's a major, major writer for us who died last year, and that was his first novel. And it's a book, tonally for me, that has, um, I guess, a kind of, like, it has a, a lurid humor in it that appeals to me, and I, I also have a lurid humor. Um, so, and Dostoevsky is a big, big writer for me. I love The Brothers Karamazov, which I guess isn't like a, you know, it's not a prison novel exactly, but it deals with moral issues that are of great interest to the person asking questions about justice and law. Um, and so that book figured large for me. 
Hi, Rachel. Uh, thank you so much for tonight. It's been really wonderful. I wanted to ask um, if someone wants to become more educated, more aware, more involved, or perhaps just you know more useful um, with regards to these kind of concealed and as you said, concurrent kind of systems and, and ecosystems of these sort of people's lives, this prison system. How do you suggest, aside from reading about it, how can someone actually, I guess, educate themselves more on these systems and be useful within that system? Wow. Well, I don't, you know, I don't consider myself necessarily an authority in answering that question. So I answer, but with the caveat that I, I don't consider myself somebody who should be dispensing advice on, you know, what to do and what's most effective. But I would say that you might read the piece I wrote <laughs> in the New York Times Magazine um, that appeared last Sunday, and it was a 10,000 word piece called, um, Is Prison Necessary? And I spent two years on it and kind of laying out, it's a, it's a profile of a, of a person, an activist and scholar named Ruth Wilson Gilmore, but it's also meant to lay out um, some terms and clear up some misconceptions about mass incarceration. And it maybe is particular to mass incarceration in the United States, but I think it's worth reading for getting a bigger picture of what the abolition movement is and how it relates to reform and what kinds of reforms work and what kinds of reforms don't work and the sorts of campaigns that people have done historically that really have started to make a difference and that's what the piece is about is this woman, Ruth Gilmore, and the campaigns she's been involved in um, and the work that she's done with a great deal of other people, including Angela Davis. Um, but that said, about advice and what, you know, how to get involved and make a difference, um, over the time I was writing that piece, I got so involved in writing the piece, it took thousands of hours that um, I neglected to write to a childhood friend who is in a prison in Missouri. And my mother called me and said, you know, Gary longs to hear from you. And I thought, I'm busy dismantling mass incarceration. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny to me at all when I saw the irony of that. And I think that it's a constant struggle to figure out how to pay attention to individual people and also how to use your voice in a way that's effective and reaching large numbers of people. And I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, <clears throat> I thought the characters, uh, you uh, were wonderfully drawn, I, particularly the male characters. I just wondered how you developed uh, male voices with such authenticity and uh, whether you thought women write better men than the reverse. Well, I'm Cartman. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> But no, I, I mean, I am. I mean, either that or gender is a bit more ambiguous than people have been construing it to be for the last many thousands of years. I mean, when you write, it's a more, um, it's a much more open uh, space, I think, of thought. Like the thought is less determined by, um, I don't want to get all like gender studiesy, but, it's less determined by um, the way that you've been acculturated to your own gender and to kind of sell it over the course of your life. Um, and some of that's learned, some of it might be natural, but when you're writing, I don't know, there's just something much more free that happens. And um, like a lot of writers, I'm interested in people. And I'm not interested in judging them, I'm just interested in understanding them and. I, I like voices a lot, and all the characters in the book are me on some level. They're like, you know, d discreetly disseminated, ventriloquized parts of my voice. And the men in the book are just as much me as the women. So I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm just really good at writing male characters. <laughs> oh, but thank you, thank you for that. Hi, Rachel. Um, I had a question about writing specifically. Um, you, you talked about finding this resistance in yourself when you were writing Romy's character. And as a writer, you're always trying to find a new area to grow and challenge yourself. What was helpful? My question is, what was helpful for you 
when you found that resistance and helped you break through and find that voice. Is that Madeline? It is. Hello. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Madeline was uh, in my class at Scripps College. Wait, I was so distracted by the <laughs> wonderful familiarity of your voice that I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question. Oh. <laughs> um, um, do you want the whole question or just the question itself? I'm so sorry to do this to the audience. Just the question, because I think I heard the first part. Yes. Uh, how did you... When you found that resistance in yourself with writing from Romy's point of view, what was helpful for you to break through that resistance and begin to find her voice and then find the flow of the novel? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. So I started, thank you for that. Um, I started uh, writing these passages that were about the San Francisco of my youth. And they were written, you know, um, in the in the point of view of a character, but I didn't know yet if I was going to use those passages. And as I'd said before, I had a certain resistance to allowing autobiographical material into the book. And then I was, um, name drop alert, I was uh, talking to Don DeLillo, the writer. <laughs> and, but look, I hate doing that, but this is, it was what happened. And he said, he was talking about writing uh, the novel Underworld which includes, Underworld chronologically moves backward. And late in the book are these scenes, mid-century scenes from the early 1950s that take place in the Bronx off Arthur Avenue, which is where DeLillo grew up. Um, and he was really from an immigrant family, lived in an apartment with a whole bunch of relatives, um, everyone speaking Italian. And he said, there was a period of time, he has a kind of New York accent, he said there was a period of time when I was the world's leading expert on four square blocks off mm -hmm. Arthur Avenue. And it kind of gave me permission to be the world's leading expert on four square blocks of the Inner Sunset District in San Francisco, which doesn't make that, the, that expertise about me, it can be used to demonstrate something about the world because you have to have specificity. And so that kind of, you know, the words of a master, if you will, um, help me to have confidence in using that material and finding a way to position it in relation to that character. Um, it sort of leads on from that question and what your answer was for this, but. Um, You've mentioned a couple of times from San Francisco and talked um, with some joy in your voice about being from California. What can you tell us in Australia about what it's like living in, Austra in California, in San Francisco right now, in this age? Well, I live in Los Angeles. I maybe should have made that clear. I left San Francisco in 1996. <laughs> um, my family still lives there. So, um, but I haven't lived there in a quite a long time. I moved to New York City um, where I'd always wanted to live. And then I moved to Los Angeles from New York um, actually quite a long time ago at this point, 16 years. And I find Los Angeles to be um, a pretty unknowable place. And I, I actually really love that quality about it because it's so complicated and vast and layered. And... Um, it's not, you know, the, 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 the whole discourse about it not really being a city isn't quite true. But it isn't merely a city because it's connected to the surrounding county. And LA County is connected to Riverside County and San Bernardino County. And those counties are also connected to Orange County, which is connected to the county surrounding San Diego, which is inextricably linked to Tijuana. And so basically you have 30 million people living in one enormous um, urban, not a sprawl, but a region where we're bringing in most of the goods that come into the United States by shipping container come through, I mean half, come through the port of LA and the port of Los Angeles and we're the manufacturing capital of the United States. And I always quote these things because I feel that I live within the matrix of the evidence of, of the largeness, the hugeness of the supply chains in Los Angeles. It's not you know, just all Hollywood and beautiful people. It's 
a really complicated dynamic city. I mean, we do we manufacture underpants, not like cars or aerospace anymore, but it's manufacturing nonetheless. So it's real life there. And I like being close to real life, even if like I've seen just in a day in Melbourne, you know, cities have city problems and in any bourgeois society you're going to see a lot of destroyed people on the street. Um, and I don't like that part of it, but it also seems to speak to the near future in a way that I am willing to live, um, I, it's something I don't mind thinking about because it's there. But California's also really beautiful, I should say. <laughs> you seem to, when you were describing it, you seem to speak with pride. So it does sound like you think it's beautiful, which is nice. Yeah, well, I, I think California also in a certain way is symptomatic of the whole culture of the United States, or it's on the leading edge of things in a way, um, for good and bad. You know, I mean, we were the big incarcerator. We launched into what state analysts called the biggest, uh, the world's largest um, prison building project that, you know, historically. And we grow like almost half the nation's food. I'm, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, I guess there's, I, I think that there's something about California that's symptomatic of the future. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, that's about time for us. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please thank Rachel. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Visit wheelercenter.com for the best in books, writing, and ideas from Melbourne, Australia, and the world.